As we study the Gospel of John, we are now in the middle of the preparation for the resurrection of Lazarus. This is chapter 11, verses 28 through 37. The Lord Jesus is deeply moved. And in this portion of the text, Mary and the Jews that have gathered there, they're brought into the picture. Martha's there. Everyone is weeping. So chapter 11, verse 28. And these things saying, she left, and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher is here, and he is calling for you. Martha went to call her sister secretly, perhaps so that Mary might also have a quiet word with the teacher. Was she successful in calling her secretly? Let's see. Chapter 11, verse 29. She, when she heard, gets up quickly and goes to him. She did not wait, but got up quickly and left. I translate this, gets up quickly and goes to him, the present tense. Well, it's because the, the Greek is in the present tense, too. And I think maybe in Greek and in English, it, it adds a certain uh, springiness. Oh, yeah, she gets up quickly. <laughs> it adds a certain vividness to the text. And maybe it's the same effect in Greek. Chapter 11, verse 30 now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was in the place where Martha met him. At that point in time, the Lord Jesus had not yet seen the Jews who had come to mourn. Chapter 11, verse 31, Therefore the Jews that were with her in the house and consoling her, seeing that Mary quickly arose and went out, followed her, saying that she is going to the tomb so that she can weep there. One little note about the Greek here, I translate, she's going to the tomb. The word to here is the Greek preposition ace, which frequently is translated into. But here, it's obvious it just means to the tomb. So we don't want to just rely on, oh, that word frequently means into in this case. Let's look more closely. Oh, yes, it can just mean to a place. So, yeah, a little note about the Greek. So the Lord Jesus and Mary did not have time for a private talk, but the mourners would have a chance, opportunity, to witness a miracle. This was to be a public miracle with many people there to witness it. And this verse explains how they got to the site of the miracle. Chapter 11, verse 32. Therefore Mary, when she came to where Jesus was, Seeing him, she fell before him to his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary seems to be a little bit more emotional than Martha because she fell before his feet, but Mary's words are almost the same as Martha's. We can sort of imagine the two sisters, when their brother died, saying these words back and forth to each other. Chapter 11, verse 33. Jesus, therefore, as he saw her weeping, and the Jews coming to her weeping, was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Now this word translated here, deeply moved, the Greek word is embrimaomai, is only used in the New Testament in Matthew 9.30 and Mark 143, John 11, 33, and 38, these in right here in this passage. Outside the New Testament, this word does have an element of anger in it. The, but in the New Testament, is it so? The element of anger is unlikely in that Matthew and in that Mark passage, Matthew 9, 30, or Mark 1, 43, why would the Lord be angry at those that he just healed? It might be there in the rebuke delivered by some of the disciples in Mark 14, 5. But so it, does this word translated deeply moved include anger? Sometimes it does, but does it here? Not necessarily. If the Lord is angry in this verse, questions arise. Why does the text note that he is angry in his spirit? And with whom is he angry? Or towards what is he angry? If he is angry, perhaps his anger is 
towards all the sins and illnesses and deaths that have damaged this world. Perhaps he's also angry because of the unbelief of some of those that are there mourning. It's as if they've all forgotten about the resurrection. But again, it's hard to be sure that there's actually any anger in this Greek word, embrimaomai. Well, with the words, and the Jews coming to her weeping, we're reminded of their presence here. They're in the background, but their presence is important because they are about to become eyewitnesses to a great miracle. Chapter 11, verse 34. And he said, Where have you put him? They say to him, Lord, come and see. With such emotion as the backdrop, he goes to the grave to defeat death and also to give a sign that points to his identity as the resurrection and the life. He will prove his statement. He said, I am the resurrection and the life, but he is about to prove that he is the resurrection and the life. Chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. This verb, dakruo, is found only here in the New Testament. The related noun, meaning tear, is dakruan. It's found 11 times in the New Testament. The verb here is in the aorist tense, but we must remember that the aorist tense says nothing about whether he wept suddenly or briefly or for a long period of time. The aorist is just telling us this happened. Aorist indicative just says it happened. In this passage, others cried, but a different verb Clio is used for their weeping. However, we also should not jump to the conclusion that the Lord Jesus weeping was somehow different from the weeping of the others. John often uses two different words, very closely related words, with the same meaning just for some variation. So let's not jump to any conclusions about the use of two different verbs here. Perhaps he was not crying about Lazarus. He knew that Lazarus would soon be resurrected. Perhaps he was crying because of all the sin and sickness and death that were still ruining mankind. Chapter 11, verse 36 and 37. Therefore the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. Love here is phileo. See how he loved him. But some of them said, was not this one who opened the eyes of the blind able to do something so that even he wouldn't have to die? Perhaps this positive response, which is, see how he loved him, would develop further to become the positive response recorded in verse 45. And this little bit negative response, namely, wasn't was not this one who opened the eyes of the blind able to do something so that even he wouldn't have to die? Perhaps that somewhat negative response would develop further to become the negative response recorded, recorded in verse 46. Is not there a note of criticism here? They seem to be compelled to point out a failure in the life of the controversial rabbi. And so, in a way, this is another instance of people's contrasting response to the Lord Jesus, which has been a major feature of these chapters since chapter 7 on to here. They did not understand the nature of the Lord's tears. They must have thought that he, like them, was crying out of despair over the finality of death. And Likewise, they didn't understand that he who opened the eyes of the blind man was indeed able to cure Lazarus before he died. They are confused. They do not yet understand that the Lord Jesus has a much more glorious plan. Through the miracle that is about to happen, the Lord will make the difference between those that walk in the light and those that walk in darkness ever more evident. These people, they're sympathetic people. They have come from Jerusalem to mourn with Martha and Mary. We might say they're nice people, but we will see the same divided response even among these nice people. 
that's been noted by John ever since, again, ever since chapter 7. There's some irony in this statement. Not only could he have kept this man from dying, but he will raise Lazarus from the dead in a few moments. So by way of summary, now all the right people are there. Lazarus is there, dead in the tomb. Mary and Martha are there, and these Jews, a mixture of Jews that will respond negatively and will respond positively. They're all there. What will happen next? What will they see? <laughs>